Good morning, everyone. Uh, as I walked in today, uh, a very keen young man walked up to me with an Ametia badge on and said, is this your first life cycle? And I thought I was in some Buddhist retreat where uh, I'm going to come back. So basically, if the uh, presentation is rubbish, I'm doomed to repeat this uh, for all eternity. So what I want to look at today is some of the insights coming out of our top 500 research. So I'm going to sprint through, and if you've got any questions on it, either shout them out or any abuse. Equally, if um, you want to catch me later, uh, just grab me, I'll be around. So um, how do we connect with the increasingly demanding, evil, thoughtless customer, i.e. us when we're not at work? So this is our question. So I'm going to look at the top 500. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about experience and then finish off with uh, the notion of being human or authentic at the heart of retail. Before we dive in, how many people here are retailers? And the rest of you, filthy overheads. No? So um, it's retailers and brands I'm going to focus on mainly. Um, in our top 500, uh, we track, and this is our third year of doing it now, we track about 17,000 uh, businesses that have a buy button online. Uh, we look at everything from turnover, stores, traffic, e-commerce. Um, and just to give you an example of the size, the number of stores in our index ranges from zero to 12,000. Who's got 12,000 stores? The post office. So, surprise. Uh, people like Boots have got vast numbers of stores. Uh, we're looking at the average t um, traffic uh, in terms of visits go from something like nothing up to 275 billion. And we're looking at people with a range of turnover from just under a million to 70 billion euros. So even within the 500 we look at, there's an incredible range of activity and scale. We then run them through uh, about 390 different metrics and Ta-da! Here's the answer. So, in Europe, these six retailers are statistically an order of magnitude better across our 392 metrics. And you'll notice with a level of unhappiness, we have two US global brands, two Scandies, uh, a chemist, and uh, a fast fashion retailer. Uh, and interestingly, you'll see that Amazon is not in that elite group. Not yet. However, Every time I talk to a board, the one topic on every board's agenda is Amazon. And so what's interesting is that currently, they're affecting the industry um, disproportionately to their size. However, it's just an indication of how much more there is to go in terms of disruption. So let's look first of all at the pressures on retailers as we look across um, Europe. Well, the first one is marketplaces. Now, in our top 500 retailers, when we measure all of the visits to the 500, 41% of all customer visits go to two websites, Amazon and eBay. Now, if you're an optimist, they say, hey, 59% of the traffic is left for me and 497 of my best competitors. Or you're thinking, dear God, what's left for the rest of us. The third most popular vis uh, website in terms of visits is Allegro.pl. Anybody been to, uh, been to Allegro? Allegro is a Polish language, Polish only, Polish credit cards only, delivers only to Poland marketplace, and it's the third largest single property in Europe, and it's in the top 20 of every single country. It's the third most popular website in Iceland. Third most popular. And when I presented in Iceland, I got booed. I thought, you can't boo facts. Anyway, that's, uh, that's the reality. Now, interestingly, when we look across Europe, there are about 400 websites in total. And these range from things like, I don't know, German people in a forest selling tin soldiers to each other, up to things like Depop. Who, who knows Depop here? Right, so that means anyone who's put their hand up is either a millennial or has kids who are millennials. For those who don't know, Depop is where kids sell clothes that your dad is too fat for to other teenagers and call it vintage. And the only time you'll ever hear of this is when your daughter comes to you and says, Dad, can I have your PayPal password, please? You <laughs> 
A no, B no, and C why? And she said, oh, I just want to buy something on Depop. And so my daughter had gone uh, to my Oxfam pile and taken a really lovely Carhartt t-shirt that I love immensely, but there's no way this is going back into that t-shirt. And she sold it, 35 quid. She now buys things on eBay and does arbitrage to sell them to other gullible people on Depop. People leave university to have full-time careers buying and selling and traveling the world on Depop. Marketplaces are where customers go to sell to other knowledgeable customers. The days of it being things you stole from a car parked outside uh, your house have been and gone. This is where knowledgeable customers enjoy selling to other people who share their passion. And it's no longer just, you know, throw things, check out. It's all about that understanding. Relevance is the key thing here. Here's another number, 200 million. That is the number of SKUs available on Amazon.co.uk today. When Amazon for Business launched in beta in Germany in January this year, they launched with 100 million SKUs. Not the same SKUs, of course. So we're in a situation where if I think of it and I already know the product, I've already bought it from Amazon. And last Christmas, 36% of all buying journeys, i.e. a visit to a website that resulted in a purchase, started on Amazon. And what this means is if I know what I want, I can get it on Amazon. If I don't know what I want, I'll Google it, and then you're fighting with everybody else. So when you then bring bottom up and think that everything from Instagram um, or Depop are teaching people what they want, you're then stuck in this middle bit of no traffic, no margin, no hope, and no happiness. So you're being squashed from both sides. It's a fundamental challenge now as we see retailers trying to become marketplaces just to win in the skew battle. But the thing that's getting lost is relevance. You don't need 200 million SKUs that no one gives a shit about. You need the right SKU for the right customer at the right time, and then you shouldn't spam her every Friday saying, buy it again. I mean, I've just bought a washing machine. It's a thing of beauty. It's a thing of beauty. Uh, and I'm getting emails from John Lewis asking me to buy another washing machine. I mean, how many washing machines does one man need, even if he dirties clothes a lot? So, you know, this whole relevance thing comes back and forth. And behind all of that, we're in a world where ruthless, consistent brilliance in operations is now taken for granted. How many of you have um, dropped an email to Jeff Bezos in the last month saying, Jeff, we haven't really met, uh, and I know there's a court restraining order stopping me sit outside your house, but I just wanted to drop you a note to thank you for the fact that in years of Amazon Prime, you've never let me down, and it's just fantastic value for money. Has anyone dropped that note? Anyone mailed ASOS saying, we just love the way you guys are ramping up your capabilities to get me things I don't need on the same day? Anyone? No, because you're evil, ungrateful people, AKA customers. However, when somebody drops beneath that 100% capability limit, oh, moan, 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 tweet, 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 I hate you, I'll tell all my friends. So we're in a world where brilliance is taken for granted, and anything less than that is punished severely by ungrateful, demanding, connected customers. No one in their right mind would start a department store now when you're trying to juggle as many SKUs as Amazon with the levels of capability they offer and lack of gratitude from customers. And we're seeing spread across Europe, driven by Prime, but you know, we're seeing now Net-A-Porter, Farfetch, Castorama, even Ikea, are upping the capability on their operations phenomenally. Now, the other problem we have as retailers is that most countries have got quite a few retailers already, and no one asks you to come and join them. So brands tend to be regional or, uh, in some cases, global, whereas retailers aren't. How many Tesco's are there in Latvia? Did the French government, did Macron write to Theresa May and say, would you send Tesco to France, please? We really need another supermarket. And what you find is that Tesco's advantage in the UK is based on property and operations and buying power. But Carrefour's done that in France. So we're seeing that if you want to open up this magic world of international, it's way, way, way more work 
than you think. I once had a chairman who said to me, Ian, there's only ever a gap in the market for people with sharp elbows and the willingness to use them. And what we're seeing is that retailers quite like to pick up the lazy traffic, but the amount of effort required in order to localize and really connect with customers is not work that's being done by enough retailers if they want to grow. So we have easy growth based on a cheap pound, good logistics, product availability, but that's it. And so um, I, I'd encourage you to look at this because I think this is a pathetic level of lack of localization, lack of payment, lack of language, lack of customer service, and basically just a lack of giving a toss. But even as we're not giving a toss enough to connect, everyone's making our life harder. We check um, product pages and product listing pages of all of our top 500 in every country. Uh, yes, we actually do. And we look across all of these merchandising techniques to see who's doing what, where, and how. And every year we do it, more and more people are using more and more techniques more and more well. And so even as it's getting more difficult to grow, there are more good people trying to get the money from your customers' pockets. So again, I, I won't go into that in detail now, but do have a look at that later. And then the fundamental problem we see with retailers is we behave like stalkers, like that spotty, slightly smelly, pimply-faced youth at the school sixth form disco who just won't leave you alone. And if you think about things you like buying, you buy clothes because you want to be seen with your friends or it expresses your personal style. You don't buy clothes to make Topshop happy. You don't buy clothes at three o'clock on a Friday when the open rate is marginally higher than 4 a.m. Who gives a toss? And what we have with retailers is they focus still on this red line. Um, spam, 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 convert, get out of bed. I'll talk to you again in a little while. And we're seeing increasingly, especially driven by the millennial mindset, not the age, but the mindset, that we just don't need any more stuff. We don't need any more stuff. The MasterCard Global Spending Review came out um, earlier in the year. And what it's showing is that people are spending money on experiences, eating out, living and being with friends. And the things that are dropping out are purchases of hardware, purchases of um, luxury items. No one needs more luxury, but we do need time with our friends. I mean, how many people here uh, are Apple fanboys? Five or more Apple devices? Keep your hand up if you're enthusiastic about the Apple 10. We've passed an evolutionary threshold. My thumb isn't long enough. And I will not be that person that needs two hands to type in a phone as I walk along the street. That was an iPad. But do we need another iPhone? Now, I'm going to buy it, of course, because I'm, a, I'm a, in an abusive relationship with Apple. But the key thing is, it's not a thing of joy. At this time, none of my friends will say, oh, Ian, you've got the iPhone 7. They're going to say, you tosser, you victim, stand up for it. So there's a point where luxury and necessary products become the Harvey Weinstein of consumption. And we're at that tipping point. And retailers need to get with their customers in terms of relevance and living their lives with them. Now, who does this well? Brands. And this is where um, we need to move. Now, Tesco, of course, savage, ruthless, intelligent, capable people have decided that if they keep a wage slave who's under-trained, under-empowered, treated like a criminal, but they stick her name in front of the sausage rolls, I'm going to love them more. Are we feeling love? Do I believe that she's called Mel? Do I think she chose the sausage rolls? Does she want to be there? Of course not. But all of a sudden, I'm supposed to spend more money. So we're seeing this, the village of commerce, store experiences, but some of it, try me, try, no, I know why I'm here. So I think we've got to be careful when we try and do this. Another attempt by Waitrose, this is where middle class people go on the way home from work. Waitrose fans, alcoholics, if you're an alcoholic, you love this. This is the King's Cross Waitrose store. Anyone been there? It's a massive store with no parking. You think, who the hell can carry the stuff home? But in fact, next to the wine bar, there are people who've paid four to 10 pound corkage to drink their bottle of Cloudy Bay 2015 on their own with no guilt. This is like Match.com 
Ecom meets middle class shopping. And so you can have cooking, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as well as drinking the wine bar. They're making the store a social hub. So you can cancel all of your dating and Tinder apps now, just get some wine, cut the chase down at Waitrose. But again, trying to make an experience. But these are real experiences. Um, ice climbing, I don't know if anyone's tried ice climbing. Uh, I've learned a big lesson, which is I'm too fat with no upper body strength. But at least I know that now. Before I spend 800 pounds on those really nice boron carbon ice axes. So this is in Covent Garden, they've got one in um, Manchester as well, where you don't want to buy an ice axe, you want to go ice climbing. And when you go ice climbing, you'd like to not be learning on your 4,000 pound holiday to the Alps. So learn about it, understand. They're living with you more than just around the purchase, and that's fundamental. The other thing that comes out is loving your product. And some products just need to be experienced. Uh, anyone come across De Viollet? It's a snotty French hi-fi brand, 30 to 40,000 pound amplifiers. But they've just released this thing that looks like um, a snail covered in gold. It is the most extraordinary small enclosure speaker ever known to humankind. So just go and listen. It makes your innards rumble. It's just incredible. It's like being at the front of a gig right next to the speakers where your trousers are shaking. When you go to the store, you have knowledgeable people who just say, give me your iPhone, pick your favorite tune, and they play it, and it's just a wow. And increasingly, if you do not have a wow in your product, no one gives a toss. If your staff do not know about the product, you'll never be able to sell it. And if all you can talk about is price, you may as well shut up shop and go home now. So bringing that product love and integrity is really important. And what this means is we have a, a difficulty with uh, this shop. This is um, Aperture Photographic. One of my weaknesses in life is Leica uh, film cameras. Um, I haven't bought anything for my camera since December 2015. But I visit this shop about every two weeks because they're nice guys, we chat about what I, what I bought, and they know at some point I'll drop a stupid amount of money. And I just need them to keep in business via their cafe, via film sales, until I buy something again. We need a relationship with retailers, not just with a product. And retailers need to have a relationship with us. So there's no point to saying spam, 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 buy my stuff, F off. We now want retailers to answer us. Now we tweet all of our retailers uh, six tweets on a cyclical basis. They're very easy tweets like, are you open on Sunday? Can I return this product? What's the address of your Scunthorpe shop? Da, da, da. Anyone should be able to answer them. Now what's interesting is in fashion, uh, across six tweets, the average response for all tweets is nine hours. The best, by the way, is two minutes. Um, over here, we're talking to Mila, is 193 hours. And we're seeing a transformation where people who used to just build things and ship them in containers are now talking directly to customers. Whereas the people who've learned this most quickly are people in general fashion, where if you aren't there with the right answer, the customer's gone. And so we see over the course, I think, of this year and next year, a massive refocusing of the organization to manage conversations with customers that aren't just around purchasing and just aren't around push. And we talk a lot about experience, AI, machine learning. Um, anyone here doing any AI? Of course not, we're retailers, not research scientists. The problem with AI is that it's not something an individual retailer can do. Other than Walmart, none of us have a big enough data set to dominate uh, the market. Walmart sells to 108 million out of the 125 million US households every week. So they have what I call data, but most of us have pathetic little data overheads that on their own are nothing. So we are relying upon uh, the software developers and the people who are developing our tools to get on board with their AI. And quite frankly, I, I defy anybody uh, to tell the difference between last year's optimized capability and this year's AI. It's still embryonic, but we're trying to use it. And you know, we, we're finding that the uh, the charge is led by online retailers who are trying to do things like image recognition, um, which then says, oh, look, what you're looking for is a, a pink pair of boots. Has anyone played with this? Because it is approaching magic. It's the kind of things where I was talking to my daughter saying, oh, look, this is really interesting. She said, oh, Dad, just shut up. 
because as, as far as she's concerned, it just works, and therefore it passes the teenage test. Whereas I'm geeking out, thinking, oh, look at all this data they're managing, image recognition, shadow, contrast detection, mapping against all of my SKUs and all of my product photography, and she's already gone, already gone, back on Depop, buying something else. But I think the challenge we have is that these individual bits of technology are not the same as either the experience of buying with and for friends or the experience of living with these boots afterwards. And we're seeing AI sneak in in other places. Um, this is an AI security bot. Has anyone seen these? They stand about this high and they look somewhere between a sanitary product and a KitchenAid. And they stand around scanning you um, and making comments like, have a nice day, or do you have your pass? So they're basically like, um, you know, a, a sort of an airport security thing. Except this one decided to go down the stairs and kill itself, leading to lots of paranoid Android stuff. Whereas, um, has anyone come across Pepper? Pepper the robot? I, look, I know this says something terrible about me. I fell in love with Pepper. And to me, I call her she. She's just a lump, she's just a machine. But what's interesting, talking to the guys who built it, they focus on two things. One, her eyes. So these are OLED, manga-style, high-expression eyes that follow you and watch you and flirt with you. And then the other thing they did was they invested a vast amount of time in her fingers. She has the expression of a prima ballerina all through her fingers. She can't pick anything up. Those hands are just for communication and expression. And then slapped in her middle is a bog-standard iPad, which is doing no more than logical bot software. But I don't care, because those eyes, those fingers. And so I think we're seeing a sensible move here towards humanizing AI and trying to build some form of connection or relationship with customers. And even though I was slightly disparaging about data, one thing I do think is important to say is that data is the new battle. You have to use it well. So Nike, who fought against selling on Amazon for years and years and years, um, decided to move on to Amazon, uh, I think, in March or June this year. And the reason was simple. They saw Adidas climb up the rankings, started to rival them on sales. They didn't know why. And the attraction of Amazon is all about the biggest buying data set in the world, as they've traded some brand value, and we're too important, in order to get that insight. So when you are working with uh, your technology partners or your suppliers and other brands, these days it's not just about give me a big discount, it's let me sniff your data and I'll let you sniff mine. And together see if you can find an angle for the customer that's all about connecting more effectively. And on that note, this is the human. Uh, this guy was in Rebecca Minkoff in New York, and we wandered in after NRF last year. And you can see we're all taking notes. Uh, he said, hi, he said, are you here to buy anything, or are you visiting NRF? I said, oh, we're here from NRF. He said, great, do you want to look around on your own, or do you want me to talk you through it? This is a store assistant. So he talked us through the magic mirrors, how they worked, the way the glass is optimized for anti-glare, but color contrast. We looked in the changing rooms, we looked at the sales uplift, and he was telling us the sales uplift, if you give someone a, a glass of champagne while I try it on, what the perfect number of products was, how the security and checkout system worked, talking knowledgeably about the difference between near field, RFID, um, proximity, tagging, how this all links to the point of sale, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely stunning. I said, how long have you worked here? He said, three weeks. So this is the level of passion and knowledge that we need from store staff. And it makes the whole difference, the store experience. This guy was a stylist, a technologist, a business developer, a marketing expert, and a just like that communicator. And when you think about how we treat our frontline staff normally, we, 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 we are disrespectful. How many of you here with kids would say, Beloved offspring of my loins, I think you should go into retail as a career. Just look around. I can't see a single hand. What does that say about our industry and the way we treat the people who are closest to and maintain a valuable, relevant connection with our customers? Do we want to be served by wage slaves with no career opportunity, no progression, no multi-skilling, no investment in the product. 
It is just not a 21st century approach. We talk about millennials, we sit in strategy meetings, but we don't do the right thing for our staff. And the challenge, I think, for modern retailers and brands is to have the augmented human, is to bring all of the technology, all of the data, all of the skills and our insight and deploy it, not just via a bot, but via carbon-based life forms who can wrap around our customer, maximizing their experience, and as a result, maximizing the benefit. And if we don't, all we're doing is putting lipstick on a pig. It's still a pig, it doesn't matter how nice the lipstick, and customers can see, smell, and touch a pig from 30 paces. Thank you very much. Do you want to Uh, thank you, Ian. That's a very uh, enlightening talk. You're obviously um, many retailers' favourite customer, but um, I would like to take some questions. Actually, do you, do you have some questions for Ian? Um, because there's a lot of uh, subject matter you touched on. So, would anyone like to, to kick off with a with a question? Okay. Well, they'll they'll warm up throughout the day. Um, one from okay. Hi. Have we got a microphone? Shout it out. Yeah. Oh, a great question about using Amazon or not. So um, lots of people blame Amazon. Now look, I'm I'm a I'm an old Welsh socialist. Okay, so you know, shoot me. But last time I checked in with capitalism, it was about survival of the fittest. So boo hoo, Amazon's beaten me. Shut up. It's basically step up or go home. So when someone says, oh, it's not fair, my cozy monopoly and fat margins have been taken away by a competitor, do is capitalism. So don't blame Amazon. Last time I checked, we are the ones who give them their money. So I'm not having any of that Amazon to blame. They're good, they're great, so be better, be more relevant or not. The next part of your question is, should you work with Amazon? There's that old saying that if you dine with a devil, you know, use a long spoon. And it used to be, I used to say, look, don't bother, stand alone, you don't want to give Amazon all of that data. But they're at a point now, they're so big and they have so much data that, you know, if you're a small retailer, just enjoy it. If you're a small brand, just enjoy the uplift. The problem is if you're in the fat middle, you know, you're a big multi-billion department store that sells what Amazon does, but less well, more expensively, the wrong place, the wrong time, then I'd say, just don't bother, but hope you're close to a pension that is not uh, invested badly. It's just the way of the world. And as I said, as capitalists, there's no arguing over it. It's just tough. Uh, thank you very much, Ian, for, for a great presentation. Can I ask you a question? Uh, with your preference for experiences, do you think we should be looking more aggressively at moving to sell experiences and subscriptions r rather than product that customer owns? Uh, no. <laughs> um, I think the problem is you said the word sell experience. You don't sell experience, you give an experience. So if your job is selling bus rides, transfer A to B, that's what you sell, but you give the experience as well. As soon as you start saying, let me sell it to you, I'm immediately distrusting you. So it's a little play, but it's really important. So if you are someone who sells services, do it well, but give an experience. And I think you can overstate this whole thing about, you know, if you have like the new jigsaw store, it's a lovely store, but once I'm over it, I'm over it. People have got a very, very good ability to instantly take as normal that which surprised them yesterday. So for those of us who've been married many, many years, the art of being married is A, vast amounts of forgiveness, and B, continue little surprises. And so as retailers, we have to do that in our relationship with customers as well. Always be good, always be forgiving, and add a little bit. Because as soon as you've added a little bit, once you start giving your wife flowers every month on your month anniversary, the day you stop, you're in trouble. So the only way is up. You have to give them weekly, the weekly time I met you. Every Tuesday, my first time I saw your eyes, I now celebrate that with a flower. Once I do that, I am damned if I don't do that every day. And customers are like that. So you give experience, but you sell your service. 
Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Um, anyway, thank you so much, Ian. Thank Great you. talk. Really enjoyed that.